Welcome to season 10 of the Parenting Aces podcast, part of the Tennis Channel Podcast Network. I'm your host, Lisa Stone, and this week we are talking Title IX. Yes, Title IX, again, because there is still so much information that I don't know. And if I don't know it, I'm guessing others of you out there don't know it. And we all need this information in order to help keep our student athletes safe, from kindergarten all the way through till they finish college. I am really happy that we are gonna have the opportunity to talk with a Title IX expert this morning on the podcast. And I'll tell you more about her in just one second. But before I do that, just wanna remind you that we do have a video version of the podcast for those of you listening on a podcast app. If you go to parentingaces.com or go to the Parenting Aces YouTube channel, you can put faces to voices. And also our expert, Nancy Hogshead Makar, is going to be sharing some visuals today. And so I urge you to check out the video version of this episode as well. I also wanted to remind you, if you haven't already, we'd love for you to become a premium member of Parenting Aces. You can do that by going to parentingaces.com and clicking on the join button. And you have a couple different options. You can pay monthly, you can pay annually. If you're a coach, you have a discounted option there. And we'd love to have you as part of our community. All right. That said, let me tell you a little bit about today's guest, Nancy Hogshead Makar. Nancy is a former Olympic champion. She was an Olympic swimmer in the 1984 Olympics, where she won three gold medals and a silver medal. I think this is the first Olympic champion we've had on the podcast, so I, I'm pretty excited about that. Obviously, she comes from the world of youth sports, youth competition, and now as an attorney and civil rights lawyer, She's also the founder and CEO of Champion Women, which is a nonprofit providing legal advocacy for girls and women in sports. But Nancy has lived this life. She understands what's involved in developing a junior athlete to the highest levels. And she is now an internationally recognized legal expert on sports issues. She's testified in Congress numerous times on the topic of gender equity in athletics. She's written a bunch of articles. She's even written a book. And Sports Illustrated actually listed her as one of the most influential people in the history of Title IX. Very impressive. All that said, I hope you will join me in welcoming Nancy Hogshead Makar to the podcast. Nancy, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Lisa. I appreciate it. Sure. I hope I didn't leave anything out. Your CV was a mile long. I just tried to pick out some highlights that I felt would help explain who you are and what you do to the Parenting Aces audience. Yeah, you got you got the most important thing that parents are going to want to know. So, yeah. So I, like many people, thought that Title IX just had to do with college scholarships and making sure there were equal scholarship opportunities for girls and for boys. That's not even a little piece of what time, I mean, it's such a minuscule portion of the whole uh, encompassing law that is Title IX. What are some of the things that we as parents need to know about Title IX and why do we need to know them? Sure. Um, well, I'm gonna talk about two aspects of Title IX that I hope parents are gonna know. One is the issue of their athlete as a player and what the school is supposed to be giving their athlete, number one. And then number two is I'm gonna talk about sexual harassment and abuse and um, how Title IX can protect your athlete and what you as a parent should know about abuse and things that you can do to, um, to help your athlete. Fantastic. Okay. And and we had we had Kathy Redman on the podcast a few weeks ago. Okay. And that was the first time that I understood that Title IX starts covering athletes or, or students as young as kindergarten. So Absolutely. yeah, this is something we need to understand, not just for our college players, but for our kids as soon as they step foot into school. Yeah, yeah. That, no, um, so Title IX requires that schools treat boys and girls, men and women, equally. Sports is a type of educational experience, so that's where it gets its strength in sports. Because mm -hmm. sports are sex segregated, because we say boys go here and girls go here, it actually makes the law really strong. 
-hmm. So whatever school's doing for boys and men, and you're seeing right now with the NCAA Women's Basketball Championship. Oh my gosh. The for treatment that they're getting, I mean, that is first class a no-go. That is, um, I mean, actually, we're, we're looking into whether or not the NCAA is liable under the theory that schools who are subject to Title IX have ceded authority over to the NCAA. So, but, but just, just think about the kinds of messages that this teaches young yeah. girls and also teaches young boys in that we're teaching them that girls really are not as important and that men really are more important. And I think that sort of moving forward in people's lives, those are very dangerous, awful messages to be teaching our you? Absolutely. And we're seeing the chatter on Twitter right now. We're recording this um, March 24th. So by the time people air this, the March Madness will be over and done with. However, the message is still really important to communicate. And that is that NCAA cannot discriminate based on gender in the the way it holds events, the perks that it offers to the athletes, they have to be equal. And what we've seen in the basketball tournament is workout facilities being highly disparate, goodie bags being highly disparate, meals. I mean, it, it goes across the board. And, and yeah, medical care facilities, um, right? It's, it's, look, there's a, I'm going to show you a slide in a second that talks about where, where, how do you measure Mm -hmm. equality between men's and women's sports and pretty much the NCAA is hitting all of them. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's been kind of a cluster. And again, the chatter on Twitter has been really interesting to follow because we always seem to get back to that thing. Well, women's sports don't bring in the fans. Women's sports don't bring in the revenue that men's sports do. So how can you justify treating them equally? We hear this in tennis all the time too. Sure, sure. Well, it's different in schools than it is for professional tennis players or professional athletes. Um, in schools, it doesn't matter what the source of the money is. Schools still have a responsibility to treat men and women equally. Yeah. It's, um, it's so just a little bit of fun history now. Title IX is patterned after another statute, Title VI. Title VI bars discrimination based on race, color, national origin. And um, so if you take out race, color, national origin, and you put in the word sex, it's the exact same language in the statute, which is no person shall on the basis of race, color, national origin, or on the basis of sex, be discriminated against or suffer any in any program or activity for an institution receiving federal funds, right? So in other words, the federal government gives tax dollars and the school agrees not to discriminate. Okay. Not only tax dollars, but gives tax breaks. So even private yeah. schools and private universities, though they are privately funded, they still get a tax break, which puts them under the purview of Title VI no. and Title IX. No? No, I wish. I wish it worked that way. Yeah. Oh, I thought that was true. No, typically the schools get federal funds through student loan programs. Gotcha. Right? But a lot of particularly like... Uh, I don't know, um, like high schools don't get any federal funds. Some do like, you know, there's like a lot of Catholic schools that are on the free or reduced lunch program. As soon as they get any dollar from tax dollars, then they're subject to not just Title IX, but also Title VI, uh, the Rehabilitation Act. They can't discriminate against those with disabilities mm -hmm. and also um, age discrimination, right? So you've got those four statutes oh. that all if we give you money, but they, you have to get money from. Okay. The, so it's not just a tax break. It's not just tax break. No. Got it. It's not, okay. it's not even a tax break at all. Like if somebody got tons and tons of tax breaks, but they didn't get a federal dollar. Um, but as I said, I mean, in the whole country, I think there's like a handful of schools that don't accept, uh, don't get federal funds. It's Interesting. Rare. Yeah. 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 Okay, so school gets federal funds, they fall under the purview of these statutes, but what's happening? Well, I mean, what's the reality yeah. out there? Yeah, so one of the things that Mark Emmert did when he became president of the NCAA is he stopped requiring that in order to be a member of the NCAA, they no longer had to show that they were moving towards gender equality. So unfortunately in Why? 1992, Judy Sweet and these amazing women did this fantastic project and they showed just how bad the sex discrimination was. 
as a result of that, they required this process they used to call it certification. And Mark Emmer just didn't like it. <clears throat> uh, so he said it was too expensive. <laughs> and so they stopped doing it. So my organization, Champion Women, as you said in your introduction, we provide legal advocacy for girls and women in sports. We have a, oh, thank you so much. <clears throat> we, uh, we, we have a, um, uh, we, we created another website and did, in addition to the one that you're showing there called Title IX Schools, T-I-T-L-E-I-X uh, schools.com. And we created this website so that every, so that you all as parents can see how that school is treating men and women. And um, I'll give you some examples. UNC Chapel Hill needs to add 362 opportunities for women. It needs to add six and a half million dollars in college scholarship dollars. It needs to add several more million in how it's treating men and women. Um, so, you know, I could kind of keep going, but right, but so Whoa. our website looks at, at 2,100 schools, including community colleges, NAIA, right? The whole mm -hmm. kit and caboodle. And Let me can, ask a question though. If the school isn't in compliance with Title IX, what happens? Nothing. Who's doing anything about it? The only people that can really make something truly happen are current students. So that's what our organization is doing is all these lawsuits that you're seeing around the country mm -hmm. is um, University of Iowa, Michigan State, William and Mary, um, Dartmouth, um, uh, Fresno State. Those are all because of us. So we figure out like who's upset about either a team being cut or sex inequities. And then we reach out and we create a community so that it's safe for the athlete to be able to hire a lawyer and bring a legal action. And one of the things that we're doing is making sure that we don't just fix like the small problem that got them in the door in the first place, like at uh, Fresno State, what got them in the door was medical care. They were not getting the same medical care, not just COVID, but in lots of ways, they were getting total second class treatment. But then when I showed them, I was like- When you oh, say they, you mean the women's athletic teams versus the men's athletic okay. teams. Right, the women's athletic teams were getting very poor medical care as Got compared it. with the men. Got it. Okay, the men were also getting bad medical care. You can't use Title IX as the way to fix that, but given the gender disparities, you can. So we, um, um, so we, when we showed them about, they had already decided they were going to cut the women's um, lacrosse team, and all and scholarships and all these other things. We're like you know, make sure you get all this stuff. And so that's what they're doing. It's uh, same with all these other cases, right? They're not just getting things back to a status quo or just solving like the one little brick, right? It's, you gotta, you gotta remake the whole athletic department. So I think what's important as a takeaway from all this, if I'm understanding you correctly, Nancy, is nobody is holding schools accountable for complying with Title IX. And in fact, the NCAA really has said, we don't care about the Title IX at all. You know, do what you want. Schools, you can still participate in our programs. We don't care if you're in compliance. Mm -hmm. There's nobody at the federal government level kind of, so, I mean, you know, the, the, watchdogging the, this. Yeah, there's the Office of Civil Rights, but um, they're just not, not very effective. Why? At, at, at getting big change to happen. You know, it's a political animal and usually most uh, legislators know people at every school, right? One thing schools yeah. are very good at doing. And so, you know, the school, University of North Carolina <laughs> calls up the uh, their legislator and says, get the OCR off my back. And, you know, they end up doing much less. The Clinton administration took a lot of heat for doing, um, you know, a lot of investigations. And I don't know as the Obama administration did any. During mm -hmm. the Trump administration, all we were trying to do was just like, just shh, don't anybody talk about it. We yeah. just wanted the law to stay strong and we just didn't want him to mess with things. So. Which didn't happen because we saw the reporting requirements change under Trump to make it so that coaches didn't have to report Title IX violations. Right. So what you're talking about is sexual assault, sexual violence. Okay, so it used to be that coaches were mandatory reporters. 
and they made a bunch of changes that all have to do with making schools not liable in civil court. But what they end up doing is making athletes much less safe. Um, much less safe and, and much less willing to come forward because a, it's embarrassing to come forward. B, you feel like it's a futile effort. Nothing's going to be done. And C, a lot of times they don't even, the coaches don't even have their athletes backs on this. Right. Now, especially if the person that sexually assaults them um, is a, a, is a good male athlete right. in the athletic department. That person is well protected. I was part of the legal team or part of, I was a consultant for um, the Jameis Winston case against Florida State University. And um, I live here in Florida. I'm from Jacksonville, Florida. And the um, I was getting all these memes and people were trying to respond to me and sending me pictures of her with Jameis. And I was like, that's not her, <laughs> right? Just the level yeah. of um, craziness that was going on around it. But, yeah. Um, yeah. So what do parents need to know about this? And especially as it applies to sexual assault or um, sexual harassment on campus? Right. So one thing that you can do for your athlete in that, and this is my advice for lots of different arenas, which is give your athlete a strong no. So a lot of times the way athletes progress up through the process is they are obedient and compliant. And when that coach says jump, they say how high. And I was going to say that's known as being coachable, right? You're coachable. coachable. Right. Yeah. Right. But okay. There are a couple of areas where it doesn't apply. So I'll start with the easy places. It does not apply to the kind of injuries that are those slow train coming injuries. Right. It does not apply. Um, so let me. So I was world class from the age of 14 to 22. And um, back then, that was as long as you could be an elite athlete. Um, so after the age of 16, I never got injured. So 16 to 22, no injuries. And I didn't I didn't get I didn't fail to get injured because I have some superhuman body. I mean, we were training. My era of training was really pretty brutal. Um, they're not doing the way I was trained, it, uh, but we, we just swam up to 20,000 yards a day, which is about 14 miles. Uh, we ran on top of that. We lifted weights on top of that, right? So it was roughly five hours of training a day, starting at about age 12. Um, I made it to senior nationals, our senior nationals, when I was 12 years old. Um, so it wasn't because from lack of training, it was that when, well, first in, I have a, I had a secret weapon and that my dad's an orthopedic surgeon. And so Mine too. Had, yours too. Uh -huh. oh, that's funny. <laughs> so that when, when something sort of would, you know, start to just feel funny, I could say no. Right. And I did say no to my coach because I remember I was 16 years old. I was on the second platform. I was not winning and I wanted to like blame my coach and I wanted to blame blah, blah, blah. But, you know, the truth was I knew that I was about to get injured and I didn't say anything. And so, um, you know, I, I tended to have kind of, you know, yelly coaches. Um, but fortunately, they they let me say no just at those times when I needed it, like, right. When I could tell that something was about to go long before it went. Right. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have to wait. Cause once, once you, so there's different kinds of injuries, right. I'm sure with tennis, you know, if somebody quacks you accidentally with a racket, like you can't help that kind of um, right. injury, right. There's some kinds that are just part of the game, nothing. Right. But then there's again, slow train coming where something right starts hurting and yeah. uh, you need to get off of it. You just got to rest. And that's really hard for athletes to do because all of us, our will is so much stronger than what our body can actually handle. So if we don't take care of, if we don't eat right and um, get the rest that we need, right. including, you know, icing or whatever it is, you notice I keep showing this shoulder. Yeah. <laughs> Why? Yeah. Because it was this shoulder that was the, <clears throat> the thing that kind of held me back. But anyway, so my point is athletes need to be able to say no 
to uh, a drill or they need to be able to protect their own body because only they know where that line is, right? right? right. Um, and, and my coach, because I did not cross the line, I wasn't getting injured, he could never know that I was being accurate or not mm. when I couldn't do a set or I couldn't do something, right? Um, and that same willingness to say no will help in the, let's talk about now sexual harassment and sexual abuse. So I deal a lot of in the world where, where the coach is the abuser, mm. okay? And, and we have um, that in tennis too, for sure. Oh, you big time do. You yes. Big time. Yeah, yes. Right. Yeah. So um, what 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 all athletes should know, this, even including your seven year old, is that coaches shall not have romantic and sexual relationships with the athletes they coach, regardless of age or consent. And I say that sentence so often that when I pull up my phone. And like, I can just like type in like, you know, the suggested next word because uh, uh, um, in, in school sports, we recognize, well, actually, maybe I should tell parents, <clears throat> here's the big difference between school sports and your club sport program. Okay, mm -hmm. school sports are subject to Title IX. School sports have a general counsel position. They have insurance. They have a, um, a general counsel, a president, or a headmaster, or a um, they have a Title IX coordinator. That right, the coach is part of an ecosystem. Okay, that mm -hmm. recognizes power imbalances and we'll put up those bright line rules. Coaches shall not have romantic and sexual relationships with the athletes they coach regardless of age or consent. Okay, over here in the club situation, the coach is often at the top of the pyramid and there's nobody checking on them. In those situations is where you've got to make those really very clear lines for mm -hmm. the athlete um, and allow them to be able to say no. And so then their boundaries so how can you tell a seven-year-old, a 10-year-old, a 15-year-old, coaches should not be alone with their athletes. They can be away from everybody else and have a talking to with them, right? But they should be observable and interruptible at all times. Two is um, coaches should not be friends or social media with athletes. If they're going to text them, they need to either text them with a parent on the text Mm -hmm. or the rest of the team, right? If it's a, if it's a team, uh, you know, communication, hey, practice is going to start at 5.30, not 5, right? Something like that. Right. Um, but no texting individually. Um, and then... That's interesting. That's really interesting. And I would hazard a guess that most junior tennis coaches are not complying with that suggestion. Just from my own experience. Yeah, I, I don't think it should be a suggestion. I think it should be a very bright line rule. Right. Because that's how but who's enforcing is. that? See, here's here's the Do issue, it. right? Nobody's enforcing it. Who holds the coaches accountable if the coach and the player are communicating without the parent being part of the chain or without the whole team being part of the chain or in the case of tennis, maybe the whole academy being part of the chain? Who knows that besides the coach and the player? Yeah. That's that, that's why you I mean, it's scary. Like so, so you want the hair on the back of the neck of the athlete to go up long before good touch, bad touch. Yeah. Because by the time it gets to touching, you're toast. It's it's a done deal. Mm -hmm. um, the 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 number one symptom that parents tell me what how they knew their kid how they figured out their kid was being abused was not that the kid was morose or, um, you know, really moody. It was the kid was happy. That the, 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 the coach had told them, you're not like the other girls. Mm. You're special. I love you. And they think it is an authentic relationship. They think it is true love and they are, and they will fight for the, the guy. Yeah. We're talking, this is, you know, 13, 14, 15 year olds. Um, so they, they just, they think like they're older, especially if they're a really good athlete, you know, mm -hmm. cause they're kind of told, I mean, I was number one in the world at age 14. If you had tried to tell me that I was a 14 year old or that I was not just the same as my 18 year old or 20 year old uh, peers, I would have said, you're crazy. I was training with them. I was traveling yeah. with them. I was, 
Um, uh, but but um, and and that's why the rule that I say coaches should not have romantic and sexual relationships with the athletes they coach, regardless of age, regardless of whether or not there is consent. Mm -hmm. right? That there's just a very bright line rule. Um, uh, uh, athletes should also know that a coach will never make you try to work out or compete on a serious injury. This yeah. is one of the ways that the gymnasts in the Larry Nasser case were primed to be abused. They weren't allowed to say no. Co if a coach is yelling, screaming, and throwing equipment, that is out of bounds. Mm -hmm. And they will kind of groom the whole athletic community to think that that's okay. And it is not. So, um, so who enforces those things? Um, I mean, we got two pieces, my organization, Champion Women, two pieces of major legislation passed through Congress. Um, the, fir the first one makes uh, people within the Olympic movement. So if you're a member of USTA, makes them a mandatory reporter. They have to report uh, to both police and to the US Center for Safe Sport. Um, I bet a lot of your listeners out there don't even know that there is this organization called the U.S. Center for Safe Sport. Well, they but better if they've ever been on ParentingAces.com because we have we have on our sidebar a place to click where you can type in your child's coach's name and see if they've ever been investigated or yeah, yeah. I, I'm I'm. I'm a big proponent of knowing who's coaching your child, especially in an individual sport like tennis, like swimming, right. where your child right. is often the only one on the court or, you know, in a meeting with a coach. Yeah, they need to be observable and interruptible, right? You cannot, you know, and and I mean, it's it's for everybody's protection. It's for the protection. Absolutely. Of the coach yeah. Um, Anyway, so if you go on to our website, championwomen.org, the first thing that you'll see is we've got a one pager there that I, I hope everybody, um, uh, you know, distributes to all the members of your teams and uh, to other parents and to coaches. And the way that we phrase it is we make it okay for the coach to uphold these rules. And what, what the way we phrase it is we say a good coach, an ethical coach will never try to be alone with you. Right. So the mm -hmm. good guy and let it be right. A, a good ethical coach will never give you a gift, no matter how well yeah. you perform, no matter what wonderful thing that you did, no matter it's your birthday, they will not give you a gift. Um, uh, and so if a coach, if particularly younger coaches can teach those ethical rules to athletes, you're protecting them, you're setting them up for protection for the rest of their lives. Yeah, I, that's really an important message, right? Is these lessons that our athletes are learning as seven, eight, nine, ten 10-year-olds are going to carry through once they are on a college team and maybe, hopefully not, but maybe find themselves in a situation where the coach isn't ethical, where the coach is stepping over those lines and doing things that are inappropriate and putting the athlete and the program as a whole at risk. So yeah. the, 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 the Mac daddy problem is coaches, male coaches, mostly on female athletes, also on male athletes, but some mostly female athletes. That's, that's like the, 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 you know, the, the major problem is male coaches, but 20% <clears throat> of the complaints are peer complaints. They're kind of like what you would see at a college situation. Um, the sexual violence that you would see on colleges. And in those situations, safe sport still applies. Okay. So it's mm -hmm. not just coaches. It also applies to athletes. And, um, uh, and, um, and certainly, uh, you know, non-consensual sex deal, which, which is rape. There's, there's no difference between yeah. rape and consensual sex, but that uh, also applies um uh to say a title nine investigator or title nine um process now you said nancy that most cases are male coaches against female athletes in some cases male athletes i'm going to get a ton of hate mail over that statement because every time i address this topic people you know will write in and say but they're female coaches doing inappropriate things with their athletes too 
Um, there are male. I would, I would never, yeah, I would never say there are none, but I'm just saying, just like there are peers that are yes. uh, being sexually violent with other other athletes, but the Mac Daddy issue, the major problem, are male coaches, right? That's like, you know, 65, 70 percent of all cases that come into the U.S. Center for Safe Sport are male coaches. So, like five percent are female coaches. So it's not right. that it doesn't happen; it does. Right. But it's not the Mac daddy. Right. You know, you know what, what is the risk? Um, and you know, it I, does happen against male athletes too, as we heard in the oh, legislative yes. hearings in Louisiana um, with the LSU case, it's right. not just the females that are, that are being harassed and assaulted. It's also the males, but right. overwhelmingly the largest number involve females. Right. Now the, what, what I like to say is, you know, definitely not every coach is a pedophile. And I had some phenomenal of course not. coaches that would not even, I mean, would, there's, you know, young 15 year old girls have complete safety around them, but every pedophile wants to be a coach mm. because you have access to kids mm. and you have authority over them and you can make them do amazing things. And um, what a horrible thought. Kids. It is. Right. Right. And so so that's why it's important that we can't allow sport to be the vehicle where a kid gets abused. Right. Um, and, and for parents to know that parents typically understandably naturally would expect that their kid would be as protected in a club program as they are in a school. And that's not true at all. Interesting. So club meaning even in youth sports prior to college, if Correct. they're just participating in a neighborhood league or a travel league that's not affiliated with the school, Title IX does not apply. What about in college club? A lot of colleges have club tennis leagues. Yeah. Would no, they not, be protected I'm, there? I'm not, not talking about those because okay. that's usually part of the university ecosystem. Got it. Right. Where all of the the protective, I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but I'm just saying you're part of a, a system that recognizes the, the power imbalance, right? Because I've got employees and employers all over the place. When I think of the, some of the swim teams I was on that had a thousand swimmers and, um, you know, the, what, what protections were there? Zero. My, wow. so I had phenomenal coaches. I mean, I really sort of lucked out. My very first coach ever was Eddie Reese, who is now the head coach at University of Texas. And he's been there for probably 35 years or maybe even longer. Um, but, you know, I was just a kid and I totally lucked out. My next coach was his brother, Randy Reese, who's the wow. one who said, you're going to be great. So I really, really don't get me wrong. I had some great coaches. My last coach was this guy, Mitch Ivy, who was molesting my teammate at the time. And I, I thought it was like, you know, how old you know, were y'all? I was 22. She was 16. Yeah. But I, because she's six feet tall and I, I, I didn't get it that it was molestation because it did look like consent. It did look like they were boyfriend, girlfriend. He was 33, she's 16. And I got it was creepy and weird, but you know, I just sort of, um, it wasn't until as I got older and became a lawyer that I realized just how awful this was. Um, at one point, I mean, usually when somebody is having sex with a 16 year old, that's not the only way that they're being inappropriate. So this guy, yeah. Mitch Ivey, um, he tried to use me to make her jealous. And so really after a few months, like I had to kind of like, just get my mojo from my teammates and not mm. from my coach. Um, had I known it was going to be as big a deal it was as it was, I probably would have left, but you know, I didn't really have any money. It was a little difficult, but, uh, but so the question uh, becomes where were her parents in all of this? Because, yeah, you know, no, we, no, as no. parents, we like to think that we're going to pick up on these things. Of course, we're going to know if something like this is happening to our child. Of course, oh. we're going to have the influence to get them away from that situation. And the reality, sadly, is a lot of times that's not true. Yeah. She told her parents that um, if you try to stop this, I will leave you. I will run away from home. And she wasn't getting any, like today, 
you know, there, there would have been a lot of support, like, you know, they would have, which you it would, I would have as an, as an adult swimmer would have had to report to the U S center for safe sport. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I would have been a mandatory reporter. All the other parents would have been mandatory reporters. Um, Mitch Ivy's banned for life. Um, um, but back then, again, this, the way that we normalized, uh, the way that there were so many marriages between coaches and athletes that it made you think that a romance was okay, yeah. right? Well, maybe the age is a little young, but right, we didn't recognize this power differential. And, um, you know, coaches were essentially just going from athlete to athlete, picking their romantic, their sexual partners really from within the athletes that they coach. Um, wow. So that's my that's the news that I can share with parents out there is that's one way that you can inoculate your child is to let them know what the bright line rule is, let them be able to say no and um, say no to lots of things, not just sex, not just when somebody tries to touch them. Right. But when they can hear that things are going on down the path of you're special, right? we have a whole and you get brainwashed. I mean, listen, so, you know, well, as it's a grooming. It's right. grooming. Yeah, of course. Sure. And I think it's important that that parents hear this again and and start to understand how premeditated a lot of this is. I mean, this doesn't happen by accident, right? This is a planned process. And I don't care how mature your kid is. I don't care how bright they are academically, how much life experience they have. If somebody starts telling you how awesome you are over and over and over again, sometimes those warning lights just go away. You, you, you know intellectually that this is not supposed to go like this, but it feels so good to hear these messages. And it's so easy to be sucked in to this cycle of abuse. Right. Well, yeah, especially if you don't see it coming, right? Especially if nobody's trained you or nobody's mm -hmm. taught you that, um, you know, this guy's using you. Right. This is nonsense. You know, you're but, special. Okay. But, but then they hear that as that other person's jealous because they're getting the attention, right? You know, <laughs> she's just jealous that coach is saying this stuff right. to me and not to her. Um, and that's typical teen behavior. I mean, right, right, right. And, you yeah, know. know, and that's why the whole team needs to reinforce this idea that you can't pick your romantic partner from within the athletes that you coach. This is a this is a bright line rule. And if everybody's enforcing it, if everybody knows it, um, if everybody knows that it's abuse and they see this person trying to yank them away from from other people, um, you know, that, 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 that's how we can protect athletes. Um, th th there's actually research from the international Olympic committee showing that the more elite, the athlete, the more likely they are to be abused from someone within their own entourage. Mm. Right. So actually being elite is a risk factor. Right. Interesting. And part, yeah. of, part of what makes it makes, uh, elite be a risk factor is that, um, there is the, it's at least, I did. I'm quite sure your your kids, uh, the athletes do too. Is there's this experience of giftedness when you are a really good athlete, and you there's this feeling of beauty and strength and competence and right. It's like you're when you tap into flow mm -hmm. that um, and you're special. Athlete, and yeah, right. That will keep an athlete coming back. For you know, what do I have to do to be mm -hmm. able to get that experience of flow? Um, so we want them to have flow. We want them to experience flow, but we also want them to be safe. Yeah, absolutely. So if a, a student athlete suspects that a behavior is crossing that line, um, and that line is very clear, what's their recourse? What what should they do to keep things from progressing even further? Yeah, great question. So if everybody knows where the boundaries are, so she needs to be able to report to a parent or to somebody who's in power besides the coach, 
who, uh, who say, you know, they're trying to be alone with me. They're texting me. They're calling me. They're uh, trying to friend me on social media. They're right. So if everybody knows what those rules are, then they can head it off at the past. They can head it off right then and not wait until it gets till it's till the kid's already been abused till you're already at bad touch. Mm -hmm. And if it's inside a school program, then right. you report to the Title IX officer for your school. As we learned in the previous podcast um, on this topic, sometimes Title IX offices are terribly understaffed, terribly underfunded. There may be one Title IX office for an entire school district, kindergarten through 12, and um or there may be somebody that's doing double duty that is right. being called the right. Title IX officer, but they're that's not. Right. That's not their full time position. Full time, a full load. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No, you've. But yeah, I mean, in that case, you just got to make some noise because if a school, I'm sure Catherine Redmond, she's very good at this, uh, as she describes, if a school remains what's called deliberately indifferent, if they don't do anything about a report of sexual violence. Um, then and and th then then they're on the hook, right? Then they can be sued by or, whom? By or, whom? By by the the family. Okay, but is there somebody at the federal government level who's policing this? Who's holding these schools accountable? Right. So, um, right. So remember, you've got three branches of government, right? So the the legislature passes title right. One. And then two is the executive branch. Now, President Biden, under there is the Department of Education. In the Department of Education is an office called the Office of Civil Rights. So before I was talking about four statutes that are all governed by them. Mm -hmm. So you can report to the Office of Civil Rights. Okay. okay. But you don't have to. You can go directly to court, the third branch of government, right? The, the judiciary. The court system, right? The, right. Right. The judiciary, right? And and, and go to them and say, um, you know, schools have a responsibility not just to um, predict and prevent, they also have the responsibility to, um, after it happens, to ameliorate whatever impact it had on the kid. Um, so to make sure that that sexual violence doesn't interfere with their education. Um, so um, when I was in college, my sophomore year in college, I was out running. Duke has two campuses, East and West, and I was raped when I was out for a run in between those two campuses. Oh, my gosh. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, Duke University bent over backwards for me, and they let me drop two classes. They, um, I, I got into two car accidents right in a row, and so I we just went, after the second one, I just went straight to the airport and went home. And um, so I didn't take those finals for those other two classes until much later. They moved me on to Maine West. So I wasn't, I didn't have to walk through woods to get to classes and to the library, et cetera. And they, um, they even gave me a special parking pass. Hmm. So they, 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 they busted it for me. Um, they got me counseling. What else did they They do? meaning the athletic department or the university the as a whole? whole Who did you go to? So the Dean of Students, at okay. Duke, and she's actually still there. Her name is Sue Waslick. And um, so because of her and honest, and so I got redshirted. So I got my full scholarship. I did not have to swim at all. Um, my coach at what, after nine months, right, it's time to start swimming back again. Right. And he says, Nancy, if you want to keep your scholarship, all you have to do is just show up at the meets. And I thought like, oh, I'll get 10 grand a year. And oh, I, have, I don't, it doesn't matter if I don't win. Well, you know, that's just not really how I'm made up. Yeah. So, yeah. So I, I started like swimming just a little bit and, you know, a little bit more, a little bit more. And then I ended up um, taking off uh, uh, three semesters just to train for the 1984 Olympics. Um, but again, when I think of like what accommodations that the school gave me, that this is 1981. Mm -hmm. So this is long before what people were thinking what schools had to do, but this is what a school would do if they just cared about me. You know, I was very lucky and my rapist had no power. So he was not a good athlete. 
was not a professor, was not, right? There was nobody on the But he was side. a student? He was a student at the I university? Don't, I don't think he was a student. They okay. found him. Oh, okay. Um, he, was, he, was, he was beaten up too. Hmm. It was two and a half hours. And so he was beaten up too. So we think he probably had to leave campus. But this, the police department were so nice to me. The feminists who came before me really made it possible for, you know, if I had was raped the exact same situation, but I was in Africa or a lot of places in South America, I would have had to marry that guy. Mm -hmm. I would have, it would have been terribly shameful for my family. Right. So I'm, I mean, I, so people kind of want to tell the story of like, yeah, Nancy, you know, uh, she got raped and two and a half years later, she won gold medals in the Olympics. And I don't want that story. Like, that's not the story. The story yeah. is, you know, somebody was, I, 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 I cannot over exaggerate just how bad my PTSD was um, and just how fragile and how easily I could have gone off the reservation and not finished school and um, not gotten back into swimming. But because people had empathy for me, it also sort of enlarged my ability to be empathetic towards other people. People are not empathetic towards parents of kids who are sexually abused. People are not empathetic towards uh, really 15 year olds who, um, anyway, so it sort of expanded my ability to, you know, just we're all these, the human frailties that we have and how we really need this community of support in order to be outstanding. Well, um, and imagine how different your experience would have been if Duke hadn't done what they did for you, right? If they hadn't believed they you, that they, they, believe they believed you, that was the first thing that was a plus in your column. They accommodated you. That was the second plus. They allowed you to be the one making the decision about how and when you were going to come back to class and to your sport and didn't threaten you with taking your scholarship away or telling you you were going to be kicked off the team. So, you know, right. you it's hard to say a rape victim is the, a lucky one, but given your circumstance, I was you know, definitely a lucky one. yeah. And the reason why I come forward, I'm, 50, I'm going to be 59 years old next month, is because when I was raped when I was 19 years old, I desperately wanted women our age to talk about it. Yeah. I desperately wanted, like, I and I couldn't find any. I right. mean, did you know anybody when we were no. 19 years old? No. To, right? No, no, no adult women were coming forward no. who had great lives. That's why I didn't want somebody yeah. like, you know, right, who was in prison or something. No, I wanted... Somebody right. like, you know, Lisa Stone. I wanted, you know, right, somebody amazing to say, like, I was raped and it was awful and I suffered terribly from PTSD. And here's how I got over it. Here's mm -hmm. how I, um, you know, here's how I was helped or whatnot. Right. Right. So, right. Um, yeah. Right. Um, yeah. So this hour is going by so quickly. Um, I know you wanted to share some information with our audience. Um, you had some stuff on on your computer that you were going to share with us. I think, we, I think we got everything that we needed to get out of this. If okay. people would go on to Title IX schools, T-I-T-L-E-I-X, like Roman numerals, schools.com. Schools with an S? Schools, yeah, with an S. Okay. Title IX schools with an S. Okay. Um, dot com, and they can see how every school that they're being recruited, how they treat women, because you better believe if they're discriminating against women in the athletic department, that their Title IX coordinator is also going to be doing a terrible job. That mm -hmm. when it comes to if they got pregnant, if they wanted to be hired, um, right? Rarely does somebody sex discriminate in one slice of way, right? It usually in, in lots of different ways. Right. So, yeah, if, um, so I recommend that people go on to that website prior to, and then all these, all these particularly parents um, who have athletes who are at a school, um, if they check, see what's happening at their school, remember their kid could be the one to make the difference. So yeah. what we ask for is we need to get a community. So we need to get the kids I mean, the kids, the 18 to 22 year olds, the parents, the boosters, the alumni, all on one Zoom call, usually like in the, you know, a, you know, 100 people. 
And then uh, we kind of walk them through what it looks like to restructure their athletic department. And when your athletic department says, don't worry, we're in compliance, don't believe them. Hmm. Believe the numbers, believe the data. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, I keep going back to this whole thing of people saying, well, I would never leave my kid in a situation like that. I would insist that they leave or I would yank them away from that coach so quick their head would spin. And the reality is, parents, please know that A, your child doesn't always tell you when something is going on that is right. oh, not no, kosher. More of research on that. I would say, I would say, um, you know, if no parent thinks that their kid would keep something right. that serious from them. And the research shows they will. I mean, I have three kids and I had to like accept that for myself. Okay. It's not going to come from my kid. They are not going to come to you. you got to find other ways. Right. Um, and interestingly, after I did the interview with Catherine and with Karen, I went to my kids and I said, you know, this is a horrible question to ask now that you're all adults, but did you ever experience anything like this when you were in college? And thankfully they said no. Um, and I'm assuming they're telling me the truth because it's in the past now, but, but all of them knew people who had had experiences. And interestingly, even one of my kids said, you know, I had things happen that were not okay, but they weren't, you know, she was never raped, but people touching her, putting their hands on her to party or whatever. And she said, you know, I would just kind of knock them away or tell them to knock it off and kind of laugh it off. And that would be the end of it. But that's not always the end of it. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. You have to give your kid a strong no to allow that. Right. We, we, especially girls, we teach them to be not, my my parents like my mom's number one goal for me growing up was that I would be nice. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh, like somebody got me some socks that said I identify as a badass, and like she was offended <laughs> by that. <laughs> like, oh, no. I need a pair um, of those. I like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you know, uh, I, I think. Um, well, right. It, it is the culture to raise your children to be nice, to give people yeah. the benefit of the doubt, especially for women. But that is changing. And, you know, as we've discussed again in the past, um, it's important to for for our boys to hear these these podcasts and learn these lessons, just as it's important for our girls to hear them and learn them. We have to raise sons who respect women, who aren't going to put any woman, any female into a compromising situation, who, you know, are going to stand up if they see someone else doing that to a female or a male, anybody. We, we want to raise children who stand up for what's right and who are going to come to the defense of somebody in a scary or precarious situation. And that that pertains to our sons and our daughters. Yeah, there's a really great organization I recommend called the One Love Foundation. And I think it's like the Twitter handles join one love. <clears throat> O-N-E-L-O-V-E, and they um, they talk about how to have healthy relationships. My son, who's now 20 and he's a sophomore at Duke, is he was he was a facilitator for the Join One Love, and um, they 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 go through they show a video uh, and they show it getting progressively more and more controlling and dangerous. Um, Yardley Love was killed by her boyfriend and all everybody around her saw all the signs, but they didn't realize what they were seeing. And um, so I, anybody who's interested in like, how do we teach both boys and girls about what, how to recognize the warning signs of, of uh, unhealthy relationships that really can escalate. I think the name of the video that they show uh, the students is called Escalation. Interesting. Uh, well, we'll have a... Yeah. We'll have I, all I, I those links. Son, yeah. I tell my son, like, what you're looking for, honey, is you want enthusiastic consent. Like, yay, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> 
We will have all of these links in the show notes on parentingaces.com. So make sure that you click and, and check them out and check out these organizations. If you want to get more information, you can always follow Nancy on Twitter at hogshead3au. That is her Twitter handle. Um, she is very active on Twitter. That's how she and I connected. Um, it was kind of as a result of everything that's going on at LSU with some of the female tennis players at LSU. And um, so I encourage you to follow Nancy on Twitter. Nancy, it's been a pleasure. I, it's been educational. This is continues to be a, a topic that gets me kind of in my here, you know, it's just, it's yeah. so painful to talk about, but it's so important. And parents, we are the first line of defense for our kids. We have to have the information then we have to pass it along to our kids and ensure that they're utilizing the information properly. And then we have to be the watchdogs. We have to, as our kids start in sports and progress through, we have to make sure that we're keeping an eye on things, that we're checking out our kids' coaches, that we know who they're traveling with. When they're old enough to go to tournaments with a coach without the parents, we have to have some precautions in place in order for our kids to stay safe and for us to know what's going on at all times. Those coaches that tell you they don't want you around, maybe there's a reason they don't want you around. And maybe that needs to be a red flag that you need to investigate further. Yeah. All right, Nancy, thank you so much for doing this. I appreciate your time. To my listeners, as always, thank you so much for tuning in. We will catch you next time on Parenting Aces.